today's guest is Mike Meyerly. He's the principal at Etro Construction Limited. So, Mike, thank you, thank you for coming on the show. Great to be here. Yeah. So, when I look at your background, I mean, your your schooling was really focused on construction management and architecture. I mean, what what did you want to be when you were really young? Like, was this a constant theme, like building? Yeah, I had a lot of family, not my parent, not my father or my mother, but a lot of our family was in the construction industry, in the building supplies industry. And so as a young kid, uh, I was always intrigued by the tangible kind of work. You would walk down the street and see how it's being built or see buildings and cranes and always was very interested in that. So my parents used to sit at the dinner table from a very young age and say, what do you want to do when you grow up? It was a constant theme in my house. And and I, you know, I was, it was always engineer, or, you know, carpenter or something like that. Always some, you know, some relation to construction. And about, I don't know, about grade nine, I knew exactly. I started, my dad and I started like looking at what, you know, what was available. So it was either the UBC, you know, path to engineering uh, or the BCIT path to kind of construction management. Uh, and so kind of in grade 11, grade 10, I decided to take, it was course selection I had to make in grade 11. So at the end of grade 10, I was like, I'm going to be CIT. Uh, this is what I'm going to be doing. I don't think I want to be an engineer in design. So yeah, that's how I that's how I, uh, I jumped from high school directly into BCIT. Yeah, yeah. So you got your degree, and then did you jump? I'm looking at here. Did you jump straight into estimating, or did you did you have something else? Yeah. So I came. I I did my two year uh, diploma program, which is super intense, like 50 hours a week for two years. Uh, it's uh, it weeds out the week. I'm going to say uh, the way that the BCIT has got an amazing program really gives you a good foundation. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I graduated on the Friday or, or my last class on the Friday and Monday morning, I was in a, in a desk as a junior estimator at Ledcor and, you know, uh, in an office downtown. So, yeah. I mean, was it, was it what you thought? I mean, there's, there's sometimes there's a difference between, you know, doing it in, in the classroom and in the field. Um, was there a difference? Well, you think that you you leave school after two years and you think you know a lot, and then very uh, and then very quickly you realize how little you actually know, and that this industry is all about experience, and this industry is all about being you know all about learning. So yeah, it was it was pretty quick. I had a fantastic you know even from my first day there um, you know to my last you know thirteen or fourteen years later, I just had was constantly provided with great mentorship every step of the way and, and you know in that environment it was um it was very it was a everyone was in at seven everyone was leaving at six it was longer days it was a different environment but yeah no I had a really good experience and I think estimating is the foundation to any great construction professional uh you, you know understanding how how the bid how the tender how the numbers go together is a foundational piece that uh you know if you're a young you know construction professional getting into the industry that's what I believe you should begin you know either that or you're you know starting in the field as a carpenter to work your way up the field route into superintendent but really in the office you can't um it's such an important aspect that some people if they go directly into project management and miss that um miss that it's it's a skill set that is is kind of I would say foundational to being a great project manager yeah. So you, you, move, you move from estimating project coordinator, project manager, which you just mentioned. Um, what are the keys to being a good project manager? Um, there's lots. There's many core competencies. Um, you know, you have to be great at managing risk. You have to be great at be at fi managing finances. You have to be great at managing people and relationships and negotiations. Um, you really, you know, being a project manager is. Um, is a very is an all-encompassing and it's, there's lots of soft skills and there's lots of technical skills. We've actually recently put together, you know, a summary of these you know core competencies and and it's it's not just the the task, but when you get you know when you get head to head in an issue related to that task, how do you how do you um, work through that right? When there's no one there to support you, you're the PM now, right? You're the guy who's got to who's got to you know take it off the chin, uh, so to say. So yeah, it's really. You know, there's there's so many um, there's so many different skill sets uh, and, and that you need to to be a great PM. 
Yeah. So, I mean, you, you mentioned one which caught my attention, which is managing risk. And give, give me some examples, some tangible examples of how uh, a PM would uh, address risks or things that you've gone through, what things that you've done to uh, address that risk. Because I think that's a lot uh, on other people's mind right now. So. Yeah, there's a ton of risk out there right now. Ton of it, and some some unforeseen risk that you'll never, you know, you can never capture. But really, when you look at a project, what, where are the difficult areas going to be? Where are the trades we believe are going to be a challenge? Um, what, what are the, you know, and the risk might be, you know, that there's a there's a um, a team member on the design team that you know maybe is weak, um, and and really pointing out, okay, can, you know, we know that we're going to have soils conditions issues on this project, so that's a risk. Let's make sure we're planning, thinking, doing everything we can ahead of time. You know, we're, we're building a large 160 unit passive house project. And so we were just having a chat a couple of days ago. And it's like our risks are really like on how we today get all of our mock-ups done correctly. How do we make sure that everybody understands every detail in that job? And if we had to spend two months today identifying all those risks, training those people, we've just reduced a ton of on-site risk. Um, and it comes down to like the simplest of details that, you know, the frame, we know the framers never done this before because it's a passive house project and we've got to wrap LVLs, keep them dry and then install them in the, you know, with the, um, floor system. And so how are we going to do that? Are we going to do it in a warehouse in a controlled condition? Are we going to do it on site in the middle of November when it's raining, you know, really identifying those risks that are going to get you, um, coordination risks, you know, for now we're systems have changed residential construction used to be a lot simpler um but now with the requirements of you know the step code requirements we're adding a lot more um uh, supply and return air requirements there's a lot more stuff jammed into these units and so the risk is you know you get to a floor and the stuff's not fitting right so we use vim as a as a method and bd and our bdc team to kind of manage that risk that on-site risk because that delay on a floor causes a month, a month costs us, you know, it could be a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars just in time, just sitting there. So yeah, really, really identifying that risk. You know, we're working now on all the projects and, and even you know our pre-construction to identify risk registers. Like what are the things we don't know? Uh, what are the known unknowns? Let's start with those, right? And so it's really important to um, be aware of where the, you know, the risks are. There's going to be things. That are going to happen without you knowing them and stuff happens and we're in construction and it's a dynamic business but a lot of the stuff that happens is caused by lack of foresight and i call it horizon thinking and so you know one of our core competencies is you know for you know, to work here and be a part of you know be a part of the uh, you know in a, in a leadership role is how far can you look ahead right because that's really managing risk can you look can you get ahead you know can you get a week ahead can you get a month ahead i'm looking six months ahead generally at what things that things are happening so yeah so that's that's a you know part of being a really really great project manager awesome so you, you had director's role and stuff but i think i'm more interested you know is um your thoughts on jumping and starting your own thing like what, what was that always the plan or is it just just hit you at some point that you wanted to do. Oh, um, so I, I always knew, I always had it in my gut that I wanted to be an, a business person. And so even at my time at my previous company, you know, there, I was doing, side, you know, small stuff on the side, whether it be, you know, uh, to, to just, you know, side hustle, they call it today. Right. But back then it was just me trying to, you know, create a, a new revenue stream and try to do some different stuff. And so, um whether that be flipping houses or whether that be doing some small renovations that I was doing you know it was it was something that always kind of um that I always know knew I, I needed to do and when I started at Ledcourt you know I I think in my first interview I was not finished when I was hired I said yeah he's like you know what's your long-term plan I remember I you know had just had lunch with a gentleman a couple of days ago but it was what was your what's your long-term plan I said well I want to learn as much as I can and then probably one day I'm going to try this on my own right so it's always been there it's always been a thing in my gut and so, but my biggest thing was I needed to be a master of my craft before I decided to make that jump. I needed to have the relationships in place, both with in the subtrade market, in the consultant market, in the ownership market. Um, I needed to have the experience in complex situations and dealing with complex problems and building large mega projects. So my resume could attest to you know, my skill set. And so if I was going to leave, I wasn't going to go, 
back and start renovating houses because that was that's not what my skill set lies. I want to build shopping centers and airports and high rises, right? That's that's where we and that's where my experience is. So so yeah, so it was um in Jill, I was really happy with where I was, fantastic opportunities, could have had any role in the company I wanted and grown and done very, very well. But I I woke up one morning and said, you know what, I want to just, I'm going to do this. And so I sat with my wife. I had one, I had one child at the time. Uh, I now have four, I have four boys, but uh, I had one child and it was, it was Canada Day. And I said, I'm quitting in 90 days. And so that was the journey, July 1st, 2015. And so October 1st, 2015, I quit. Uh, and uh, they, I, they, I stayed a month, I stayed with them a month to kind of clean up and transition. Um, the role I was running all, all of the pre-construction for that company um and so it was a uh, yeah and then November so it was just before I was Halloween and I yeah I was in I woke up on the Monday morning and walked from my bedroom down to my basement where I had a folding table and a laptop and two screens and and started so yeah it was just me solo in the basement so that's that's how it all that's how it all came together Awesome. Did, did uh, you plan for this? Obviously, because you you know you spent a, a long time mastering your craft. Um, is it what you expected? Was it straightforward? Oh, absolutely not. No, no, <laughs> no, no. It was terrifying. It was terrifying. It was not straightforward. I thought, like, I, I knew it would be difficult, and I knew it would have been challenging. Um, but I, there was that first six months where it was really, it was far more difficult to get the opportunities that I thought would be right in front of me. Because, you know, and, and then you start to question yourself because, well, you did really well working over there, but like, I, I don't know, maybe that's because that's a great company. How do we know it's you? And that was kind of a, a humbling, it was a humbling six months. And so, you know, you're, you're, we're doing small little projects, you know, for friends, basically, that's who had hired me to do stuff, right? People that we had known, picked up a couple decent, contracts that were you know great kind of not in the you know heritage house which is a you know four unit heritage house and a and a little wood frame townhouse project and so but those didn't start as they should have because you know permit timing and everything so so you're looking at cash flow you're looking at like you know you want to hire people you've got people that you know that would like to come and work with you and finding that balance of getting into a cash flow positive situation uh and and being able to continue so yeah the first six months were between november I say November and July, August, there was a lot of low day. It was a lot of days when you're working 18, 20 hours a day and you're not seeing any, <laughs> you're not seeing any benefit, right? It's just cash in, cash out. You know, you're, you're, and I, at that point I was the, I was the business development guy, the estimator, the project manager, the site super, the, you know, the material delivery guy, the accounting guy signing and writing checks like it was you know it's all encompassing right and so so yeah so it was um but it was exciting right it's exciting I had a, my family my wife and my kids were super supportive and behind me and so it was it was just that journey and then I was able to in August of 2016 bring on some more talent and every year every month or two since then I've been able to bring on more talent to to be to where we are today where we're you know full functioning you know, construction company with 75 employees, uh, you know, and, and a, you know, 300, $350 million of the work. So it's come a long way from the humble beginnings of a you know, plastic folding table. So, yeah, I mean, what, you said six months. So what was your first break? What, when did you kind of know that you know, everything was going to work out? Um, yeah, probably July, August, where we'd started a townhouse project and now people knew that we'd been hired for something um and we had you know a couple just more opportunities were rolling in and my efforts of six months of coffee lunch dinner you know whatever it was with people trying to get my you know get my name and brand out there uh then the phone started to ring a little bit and we started to win some work um and then as the work came in we were able to engage and hire more people which allowed me to continue to push forward the you know the business development effort and the you know um and looking at larger more complex projects and really making some good inroads there yeah i mean 
every entrepreneur has to address many different aspects of business demand gen operations keeping people happy and doing it profitably which you'd say uh, bucket you'd say that you had to spend the most that didn't come as naturally um i think what i was surprised by is how much energy we put into a culture like culture to me is like we've not not that I not that it was the hardest or uncomfortable, but it was it was just it's it was it's a lot of work, uh, and it's really it's so important, and we knew that from day one about being a people first organization, and really like understanding how important that is. I'm a I'm a just a nice guy who likes people. I always you know, and so but the amount of energy and time we put into it, I didn't I just didn't think about it as you know coming out of my first you know uh, in the first couple of months it was like we got to get cash flow moving. We got to start making a little bit of money. We got to find and recruit the right people. That was always kind of in my, you know, and operationally we need to execute. So I was always, those are kind of the fundamentals. Uh, and then, you know, but the people side, you know, get the people is great. Nurture the people, measure the people, coach the people, grow the people and build that really great culture that we have today. That took a lot of time and energy, um, but it's been, it's been worth it. Okay, very good. Give, give, give me some examples on, culture because he said you know it takes a lot of time what, what are the things have you done to cultivate that we just we do you know as a, as a company we've um we do lots of events there's lots of things to bring people together uh we have a lounge in our office with you know foosball ping pong beer taps you know uh where we have it's a, it's a place for people to come together and really like spend time outside of you know their day-to-day -day. Uh, we've got a very strong mentorship and we call it people builder program where like mentors coaches and players are engaging together and you know to ensure career development um we're you know we're really you know i'm following kind of the way that i was raised in the industry right like you know really having that great leadership that is connected and so my office is always open you know just yesterday i did a career mapping plan with one of our you know younger project managers to really be a part of like his growth and development and creating that connection is is important and what we've also done is really created these interrelated kind of casual relationships where PM to PM connection is strong um, in, in an effort to make sure that they, um, you know, if you've got a question, you know, ask your peer, right? You know, your peer is available to coach you and help you. And so we've fostered this amazing, you know, um, uh, culture of like really collaborating and being, you know, and, and not being scared or afraid to go and ask, uh, you know, ask the person beside you. Yeah. Um, going forward, I mean, you sound like a planner because someone that spends 13 years really preparing themselves to start a company is a planner. So yeah. thinking ahead, how are you thinking about um, the risks, the opportunities and, and trends um, for the future? To be honest with you, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm concerned about the future right now um not so much for my company but for the future of um our industry um so logically, you know we're we're seeing unprecedented impact whether it be inflation or supply chain or labor challenge shortages um and i think we're going to see a significant impact um from you know a variety of uh labor associations over the next while that are really going to create challenges for our business i think um i think the core the core i think inflation will resolve itself my opinion is that it will it will subside i think that supply chain will correct itself you know in in time um but the labor shortage in vancouver is not in a place where it has any um signs of correcting itself and so my energy right now and my focus right now is how do we how do we train mentor coach and grow the people within so that we can take a 18 year old carpenter and turn them into a 25 year old superintendent or project manager um, my other goal is how do we go and get to high school students and show them that construction is an incredible business where you can be in technology, you can be, you know, you can be in a collaborative environment, you can make fantastic money. 
Uh, it's not a dirty job. That stigma of, of construction being a you know a person down a hole, you know, digging a pipe is is completely changed. You know, we've got a technology group here. We've got a VDC team. All of our all the tools we use are as are at the leading edge of technology, right? So it's it's really opening the eyes of high school students right now, yeah, and finding a way to really get in front of them to say, you know what. You, your fastest way right now in, 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 in a lot of industries to get to making a really good wage, you know, whether it be 40, 50, 60 dollars an hour, it's probably our industry. Uh, and you have a large spectrum of um, talent that's available. Um, with all of the people that are going to retire in the next 10 years, all of the baby boomers who are set to retire, we are going to have, I don't believe the numbers. Um, I believe the numbers are going to be far worse because we're already seeing the impacts right now of, of just crews not having the um, depth and experience because there's so much work going on. The mentorship and training programs haven't been great. There's been pockets, like companies do a great job, but our industry as a whole hasn't really embraced, you know, um, you know, other than, you know, there are great residential programs. There, there are those programs, but, you know, uh, you know, if you're a cabinet installer or a flooring installer or a drywaller, like it's really, you're learning on the job and there's, and if you had a, didn't have the great mentor, um, you're, you're not going to have the same skill set as though that who did and standardizing kind of those processes we're seeing is, is creating challenges related to site time, quality, you know, and, 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 you know, and safety for that matter, right? You have, you know, there's just the crews don't have the, the same level of leadership uh, that they may, they once had. So the other thing that I'm really focused on is getting in the minds of 10 year olds, right? That's when I started to think about construction. And so, um, and getting, and getting marketing or, you know, advertising or finding a way to attract 10 year olds is impossible, but you know who you can market to is 10 year olds' parents. Because ten-year-olds parents can be um, can be told and can be attracted to, hey, like it's great you're in this business, um, and so we're starting a little bit of a, a group between a bunch of the different associations and a number of the uh, institutions, um, the, um, the educational, um, would be BCIT, UBC, Qual, and we're working with all of these to kind of find a way to get some support from the provincial government to push the initiative on, like. If we don't do this, if you think housing affordability is bad today, wait 10 years because it is going to be exponentially worse and forget material cost. It's going to be there are no people available to build the project and the project that so that means projects don't get built because we just there's no capacity uh, or projects take way longer and become more expensive because there's just not enough available labor. So labor can come to us in a few ways. One is from new entries into the industry. Um, one is from immigration, and one is from transfer people from other industries. <laughs> and so we have to find a way to change the stigma of construction and create, you know, and, and it is, it is a very technical, very, very interesting, dynamic, um, collaborative industry that is, you know, I couldn't imagine um, something more fun and interesting where every day is absolutely different. And it doesn't matter whether you're a, work for a cladding contractor or a glazing contractor or an electric contractor or a mechanic contractor or a GC. Like it really doesn't matter. It's very dynamic. You get to work with interesting people. You get to build really cool projects. And so to me, that's the focus is, is how do we get more young entrants? How do we get in their brains? And if that's going to universities and speaking and telling them the stories of really, you know, incredible entrepreneurs, like I've got friends that are plum, you know, plumbers and have made, a fortune, you know, um, you know, building great plumbing companies, starting, learning the trade, getting their ticket, working a few years, getting the experience, going on their own, starting a company, learning how to run a business, understanding the core technical, you know, needs to to be a plumber, but then bolting on, and and some of these guys have just done uh, and 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 have done just fantastic. So, um, yeah, that's that's the focus. Very cool. Um... When you're not running your business, um, what do you do? do? Do you have hobbies? I don't have a lot of hobbies. I, I should say. Four kids, have, you said. I got so I got four young boys, um, and and they keep me extremely busy with their sports. 
So they do, you know, they're, we spend the summers all baseball, spring and summers all baseball, soccer in the winter, a bit of hockey. Um, but I love skiing. So for me, I, I, I love skiing. Uh, I love mountain biking. Uh, I, I train at the gym four days a week to make sure that my mind is healthy. Otherwise, you know, uh, without, without the gym and exercise, I'm, um, I mean, you know, I struggle. Um, and so, yeah, and cycling, I, I just got a gravel bike last year. So I've been doing a bit of that, but no actual, like, I don't watch just funny. I don't watch sports. Uh, I don't have time to, to, you know, uh, I don't watch a ton of TV. Uh, I don't knit or, or anything like that. So <laughs> but no, I, I you know, it, it, as I get, uh, it's funny, my kids are getting a bit older. So trying to jump back into playing hockey again, because I've been off for about five years. Uh, and I'd love to play more golf, but that, you know, six hours or five hours isn't time that I have normally. So, but yeah. Yeah, sure. Is there anything that, um, that we, we didn't talk about or you wanted to share that, um, uh, you want to sort of end off with? Um, no, I think, yeah, I think, you know, from a, a new entrant coming in the industry uh, and the person who is going to coach them, I've got, you know, my, my my words of wisdom, I guess, is as a new coming into this industry, it's most important. The only thing you should be worrying about is who your mentor is, who the, who's coaching you. Um, be vocal about making sure you've got a good coach who provides you with good feedback and can give you the skills that you need. Um, and then once you find that person, your job is to just be a sponge and listen and observe and listen and just keep listening. Um, and that is what will get you to the next stage. And for the people that are, you know, like me, that are uh, mentoring this younger generation, that is your job. That is what you are here to do. And that is the way that they're going to go home. If they're engaged and they're feeling supported in their culture and they're feeling like they're a fit and they're getting what they need. Those are the kids that are going to go and tell, you know, their friends, man, like this construction thing is awesome. I've got this incredible coach. I've got this really amazing um, company I'm with. And so it's a, both have responsibility in the relationship that are equal. Um, and so, you know, in this new era of employment where you can get a job anywhere, like anyone can leave today and find a job with 0% unemployment, but believe me, that will change. It always does. Um, and so. Don't be focused, you know, for, for the young, new professionals, don't be focused on the dollar, be focused on the mentor and be focused on the learning and go to a place where you're going to get the learning and the mentorship, uh, the money will come. And I, you know, I was told that from a young, you know, young age, you know, coming and being considered, well, a friend of mine got a few dollars more. The money always comes if you have the knowledge and the skill sets. Well, great advice. Thank you for uh, sharing your story. Yeah. Thanks so much.